Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's thought-provoking master masterclass focused on the correlation of lumbar total disc replacement indications to patients that you may see in your practice. And our sponsor this evening is Sentinel Spine. I'm Robin Young, the founder and publisher of Orthopedics This Week, and I'm honored to be the moderator for this evening's masterclass. Driving what I expect will be a lively presentation and dialogue tonight are two accomplished lumbar total disc replacement thought leaders. But before I introduce them, let me first provide you with a bit of background on Sentinel Spine and the ProDisc Total Disc Replacement Technology. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with Sentinel Spine and ProDisc, there's quite a long and documented history of proven clinical success behind this technology, dating back to the first lumbar pro disc device clinically utilized in 1990. This early platform served as a foundation for the latest lumbar and cervical pro disc technologies that continue to be successful today, and I might add, uh, award-winning uh, technologies. So on that note, there are several recent newsworthy items deserving of mention. First off is Sentinel Spine's recent announcement to divest its fusion business. This is significant for Sentinel and its customers as it allows the company to exclusively focus on the continued innovation and advancement of ProDisc total disc replacement technology. Also, within the last year, three additional Sentinel Spine cervical total disc devices were approved by the FDA. The availability and optionality presented by these multiple devices now provides the ability to select the disc, and this is important, that best matches the needs of both the patient and the surgeon. Lastly, and most relevant to the class this evening, several new anatomical end plate configurations for lumbar total disc replacement have recently been made available by Sentinel Spine, again, delivering the capability to better match the ProDisc technology to the patient's anatomical needs. So, without further ado, let's introduce our faculty for this evening. Dr. Robert Johnson from Summit Orthopedics in Idaho Falls, Idaho, completed a spine fellowship at Texas Back Institute and has become a major advocate for total disc replacement recently recently completing over 100 lumbar total disc replacement procedures in 2022. Joining Dr. Johnson is Dr. Chris Suma from Palo Alto Medical Foundation in Santa Cruz, California. Dr. Suma completed an orthopedic neurosurgery spine fellowship at the University of Washington Harborview and has consistently been involved in total disc replacement since the FDA approved the now discontinued Charité device almost two decades ago. So uh, I am very excited to begin the full masterclass and discussion and turn the program over to Dr. Suma. Thank you, Robin, for that introduction. Um, and thank you everyone for uh, tuning in. Um, lumbar disc replacement has been a part of my practice for the last 19 years, beginning with the Charité in 2004 and then continuing with ProDisc once uh, it was FDA approved. Over these many years, I've been able to figure out what works and what doesn't work, at least I think, uh, in my practice with my patients in my hands. I've also been involved in uh, teaching uh, as faculty for Lumbar ProDisc since 2008. And I've had the opportunity to share my experiences with many surgeons over the years who wanted to adopt this therapy into their practice. The patient selection for lumbar disc arthroplasty often seems a bit challenging to the surgeon who's just beginning. It can be difficult to trust that any patient outside of this perfect patient, also called a unicorn, can demonstrate successful outcomes from lumbar disc arthroplasty. And it can be difficult to determine which patients really and truly fit the indication statement. Many of us have seen our surgeon colleagues who have tremendous opportunity with arthroplasty and refer to those surgeons as super users. Having the experience and the confidence they're utilizing the device in complex and often off-label uh, situations. But to be clear, the goal of this course is not to go into advanced lumbar arthroplasty techniques. Our plan today is to cover the common questions and concerns that we see in surgeons who are new to lumbar arthroplasty, 
whether they've just started to consider its use, perhaps based upon experience with cervical arthroplasty, or that they've done a case or two and are now looking to expand their uh, patient uh, selection. So we often hear questions uh, when we're teaching or when we're talking to our colleagues, uh, such as what is degenerative disc disease? Is axial back pain a good indication for lumbar disc arthroplasty? How much facet degeneration or deterioration is acceptable in arthroplasty? Can I use lumbar disc arthroplasty in a patient who's had a prior microdiscectomy or prior posterior surgery? How much spondylolisthesis is acceptable and what type of spondylolisthesis? And can radiculopathy be treated with disc arthroplasty? Dr. Johnson and I would like to share our thoughts regarding patient selection for lumbar disc arthroplasty, answer some of these difficult questions, and hopefully you'll find more patients in your practice that we think would be excellent candidates from arthroplasty, lumbar disc arthroplasty. So by the end of this session, hopefully you'll have a better understanding of the following in the context of patient selection for lumbar disc arthroplasty. The first is degenerative disc disease and axial back pain, facet degeneration, instability and spondylolisthesis, prior posterior microdiscectomy, and radiculopathy, such that you might identify patients in your practice who we believe would be benefiting from lumbar arthroplasty. And so this is the formal uh, indication statement for lumbar prodisc. Um, but now let's discuss what it means and how to comfortably correlate that to the patients you may see in your practice. So to begin, we're gonna discuss this overlap of axial back pain and degenerative disc disease. Axial back pain and degenerative disc disease can often be difficult to describe, let alone use as a selection criteria for a significant reconstructive procedure such as arthroplasty. We've developed this diagram and hopefully this will help visualize the two axial back pain and degenerative disc disease and their contribution in the decision process for lumbar surgery and arthroplasty as a subset. So axial back pain, uh, in my opinion, includes all etiologies that result in low back pain, such as muscle strain, fractures, facet uh, degeneration, herniated discs, annular tears. So it's more of, of a symptom-based uh, phrase. Degenerative disc disease, on the other hand, is more of a radiographic diagnosis that describes imaging. Uh, and so we'll try to correlate those symptoms that produce anterior pain. So the degenerative disc disease includes all etiologies that are a consequence of deterioration of the disc. Uh, the disc and the end plate, such as disc space collapse, loss of intradiscal hydration, peridiscal end plate edema, annular tears, annular bulging, ankylosis, and those types of changes. And so it's the overlap of axial back pain and degenerative disc disease that we look at as surgical candidates. So those patients that have both the symptoms and the imaging that we can correlate as uh, potentially uh, connected and causing their difficulties. So now within that overlap, however, uh, not everyone is a surgical candidate. Sometimes that overlap produces uh, a scenario that will not be benefited from surgical intervention. But to be clear in regard to lumbar arthroplasty, lumbar arthroplasty, as we will uh, describe, uh, is a subset of the surgical patients. So the first topic we're going to discuss is facet degeneration. Uh, and the key considerations for facet degeneration include uh, the fact that the facet joint should not be the primary source of pain. Think about this conceptually. We're addressing the anterior column of the spine when we're doing arthroplasty. If there's a significant component of posterior uh, disease, posterior symptomatology, those patients will not improve with lumbar arthroplasty. Radiographic evidence of facet degeneration in the absence of posterior column uh, pain and instability does not by itself constitute uh, an exclusion from arthroplasty. Uh, and it's important to evaluate the stability of that segment. And the implication is that 
incompetent facets or facets that are not helping to stabilize that segment can lead to uh, instability and those patients may or may not be appropriate. And we'll discuss this further. Dr. Johnson, how did you become comfortable offering disc, uh, lumbar disc replacement in patients with uh, not only facet degeneration, but, but as a whole, um, uh, who, who come and present to you with, with the, these symptoms? I think it's really important to understand that we don't skip steps. We always cross our T's and dot our I's, no matter the patient and no matter the situation, uh, to truly evaluate whether they're a disc replacement candidate. Um, we don't skip steps on every patient, AP uh, x-rays, AP lateral, flexion extension, side bending, MRIs, CT scans, and DEXA scans. We really don't set, skip steps. I think it's important to take a step back, however, and understand that we really don't judge a book by its cover. I think most of us have heard that whole adage of uh, you don't treat a picture, you treat a patient. Um, I think most of us have had the experience where we've had a patient come in who, when we look at their imaging, we almost don't even know where to begin because of how much degeneration and how much is going on on the actual imaging. But then as we evaluate the patient and talk with the patient, the patient will divulge and tell us oftentimes that they really have no back pain, but they're there because they have a foot drop or they have radicular symptoms. And so point being is, don't judge a book by its cover. Our goal and my goal in my practice is to help that patient understand where is their pain coming from. Uh, just because we see something on an MRI doesn't mean it actually affects them. And facet degeneration falls right into that category. The goal is to help manage that patient's expectations so that we can reliably reproduce good outcomes for all of our patients. And I think that boils down to understanding where that pain is coming from. Now, oftentimes we have had a hard time delineating that pain um, and diagnosing what actually is the pain generator. Most of us are familiar with facet mediated pain or what currently in literature is being termed as posterior mediated pain or posterior column mediated pain. And the ability to kind of isolate that pain and understand how much pain is coming, actually coming from the facet joints with things such as medial branch blocks or facet blocks, things of, those nature, of that nature. However, when it's boiled down to anterior column mediated pain, it's been somewhat more difficult. As you'll notice, most of us are familiar with the imaging on the right, where we're seeing that facet degeneration on the axial CT cuts. Um, that gives us an idea that we need to hone in on that and actually prove, is that our pain generator or is it not? But what most of us uh, have had a hard time in the last few years in practice is really delineating where the anterior column mediated pain is coming from. In the past, we have utilized uh, discograms to help us isolate or potentially isolate how much pain is coming from the anterior column. Well, as most of you are aware, that has really fallen in and out of favor and, and provided very inconsistent results. However, in recent years, we've really had quite a few advances in the understanding of the pathophysiology of anterior column mediated pain as it correlates to the spine itself. Thanks to Dr. Lutz, Fields, Bailey et al, over the last decade, they've really been able to help delineate how do we perceive anterior column mediated pain. As you'll note on this MRI on the left side, the sagittal cut, there's circles that are delineating that notch in the posterior aspect of the vertebral body. And then approximately about 15, uh, 15 millimeters or a centimeter and a half, you'll notice that there's a slight dot. What they were able to note both on pathology slides and also mapping out of the nerve itself is that at that dot, there's a bifurcation of the actual basal vertebral nerve creating a cephalad and a caudal nerve ending that goes to the subchondral bone of the vertebral bodies, providing subchondral innervation of the act actual anterior column itself. Oftentimes we had pre uh, previously thought that the pain was mediated by the disc itself. Case in point, discograms having inconsistent diagnostic value and leading to the need for further diagnostic measures to help understand anterior column mediated pain. Dr. Lutz and Bailey 
and et al. did a very good job of helping us understand how do we perceive that anterior column mediated pain through the basorotebral nerve. But the next step was then taken in allowing us to be able to provide diagnostic value through that understanding. That diagnostic value has been evident in the basorotebral nerve ablation, where we're actually able to enter into the vertebral body, ablate the nerve at the bifurcation, thus allowing us to have both diagnostic and therapeutic benefits from that procedure. Now, the diagnostic value is similar to that of the facet blocks or meteor branch blocks in helping that patient understand how much pain is actually coming from the anterior column and thus helping manage their expectations as we move forward with artificial disc replacements. Here we have an example of some imaging that's demonstrating significant facet arthropathy or facet degeneration with cystic structures on your CT scan, bone spurs, um, and also demonstrating that on the MRIs. However, in this patient, although the patient demonstrated this degeneration and the cystic structures, when we go through that algorithm, the patient had very minimal, less than 20% of his back pain was actually coming from the posterior mediated or posterior column, i.e. the facet joints, thus helping that patient make an educated decision on what they actually wanted to do with their spine in regards to disc replacement versus fusions and other options. Dr. Suma, is there anything else that you would typically do in your practice to help you understand and help those patients manage their expectations in regards to that facet degeneration? Like you, I'm looking at the, the consistent workup. Um, historically, we would be, we used to be concerned about the contribution of, of facet disease and, and almost always we were talking about uh, diagnostic facet blocks as part of the workup. And what we found was that actually some of the patients who did have uh, positive facet blocks or positive medial branch blocks actually got better with arthroplasty sheerly by the unloading of those facets themselves. And so I think those of us that do a lot of arthroplasty um, will really evaluate the contribution of that facet uh, joint and I, I personally have become a lot more selective about who I'm doing diagnostic blocks on, specifically diagnostic facet blocks. Absolutely. The next factor that really comes into play as to whether or not a patient is a good candidate for a disc replacement is understanding the stability and how to evaluate that. Once again, as we go back to our al algorithm without skipping steps, we always get our AP lateral flexion, extension, and side bending films. And this is truly to evaluate, is there a dynamic component to any sort of spondylolisthesis or translational component to that patient? As you can see here, as we look at these images, very minimal uh, actual dynamic translational component associated with this, probably less than three millimeters, if, if that. But you do notice that there is a static retrolysis of L4 and L5 and L5 on S1 with once again very minimal dynamic nature associated with it. As we continue to look at this patient and work through this patient, you'll look at the MRI, a typical MRI that oftentimes we see with these types of patients with anterior column mediated pain or anterior column mediated degeneration where the disc starts to lose the hydration, starts to lose the water content, annular tears, bulging, and it's this continuum as that disc starts to collapse. I really look at the overall orientation of the facet joints. Number one, I'm looking at, is there degeneration there? Is there cystic structures? Are there the potential for further instability, even with a disc replacement? But then I'm also looking at the overall orientation of the facet joints. Are they sagittally oriented? Are they coronally oriented? What is that their predisposition to being dynamic versus static in their translation? As you can see here, we're looking at these facet joints at L4-5. You're seeing more of that coronally oriented facet joints. Uh, as we start to get to that L5-S1, especially on the right side facet, you know, she start to be, uh, have more of a sagittally oriented facet, thus leading to more potential anterior to posterior uh, translation or possibility of translation associated with this specific patient. As you can see with this patient, we evaluate for that stability. Is it dynamic? Is it static? We moved on with this patient to go ahead and do a disc replacement, and the patient did quite well with that. 
Dr. Suma, is there anything else you would typically do in your evaluation of the stability for your patients? That's a fantastic segue, Dr. Johnson, into our next topic. Uh, the second topic involves the discussion of instability. We define stability as less than three millimeters of dynamic translation and less than five millimeters of static translation. We've discussed stability multiple times in, in the previous topic, but this is a very important consideration for disc arthroplasty patient because unlike fusion where the hardware is only relevant through bone healing, with motion preservation, we're reliant on the design of the implant to restabilize the segment long-term. And ideally this device will last the patient's life. I'm not sure of your exact uh, patient population, Dr. Johnson, but, but at least with mine, um, a great many patients I have have some degree of spondylolisthesis, uh, and many of them, as the disc collapses, that becomes sort of the underlying etiology of their spondylolisthesis. And we see that as, as more of a retrolisthesis rather than an anterolisthesis. One of the important things to assess while looking at instability is to make sure that there is not a lytic spondylolisthesis, as lytic spondylolisthesis is a contraindication uh, outright for disc arthroplasty due to the lack of stability inherent in that fracture itself. On the other hand, for a degenerative spondylolisthesis, I have a high confidence in restabilizing that motion segment with the, the ProDisc L because of the specific implant design. Unlike a mobile core implant, where that, that uh, the core is uh, free to move and the superior end plate can translate relative to the inferior end plate, the fixed core resists shear and provides stability. And assuming that it's sized and placed correctly, the optimized radius of the poly works together with the facets to move with the proper combination of translation with flexion extension, sort of a coupled motion. Dr. Johnson, how do you go about evaluating stability? How does that change your workup? What are your, what are your thoughts of stability? Um, as you described, we can't predict how these discs or the anterior column collapses. It can collapse like a falling leaf. As it collapses, you can have subluxation of the joints. You can have retrolysis, anterolysis associated with it. So having said that, maybe let me walk you through an example once again, or another example of a patient that we would do the exact same workup for. These are our x-rays of this patient, looking at them from the side, the lateral with flexion extension views. There's roughly less than two and a half millimeters or approximately two and a half millimeters of translational component associated with this. But once again, it's less than that three millimeter dynamic translation. And we pick that up on that flexion extension views, understanding how is this translating? Is it dynamic? Is it static? As we continue to look at this patient, you can look, uh, as you can see on the MRI, a typical MRI that we would see with a patient who has that degenerative disc or that disc collapse that's happening in the anterior column at that L4-5 level, somewhat reproducible as we compare to the flexion extension views and the x-rays that we see, given the gravity in the patient being supine in the MRI findings itself. So once again, we don't skip steps. To evaluate that stability, we're really looking at understanding is there a dynamic nature or a static nature to the translational component associated with those mobile segments or the lumbar spine and each individual segment that we're looking at. So as you can see, as we look at this patient, you can see at the C, with the CT scan, looking at the sagittal and the axial views, that this patient has very sagittally oriented facet joints, which is most likely what allows or contributes to that dynamic anterior-posterior translation that we saw in our flexion extension views. Now, just because we're seeing that translational component or that dynamic translation does not mean that the patient is not a candidate for disc replacement. It's just understanding what is going on with that patient from a dynamic and static position or from a physiologic standpoint, and then understanding the type of implant that we're using. As Dr. Suma had discussed, that semi-constrained bearing actually provides some of that stability inherent to the actual implant itself. Thus, in situations like this, where you're seeing more sagittally oriented facets, and some dynamic translational component to this is well within the parameters of the actual disc replacement itself and therefore is a good candidate for a disc replacement. 
as you can see here, patient went on to have a disc replacement um, and having done this myself, patient did quite well even one to two years out. So to clarify though, Dr. Johnson, if we take a look at these pictures, this is a highly unstable segment and this would not make for a good arthroplasty patient, is that correct? Absolutely. As you can see here, even from a static nature, you're on the verge of grade one to grade two spondylolisthesis associated with this. And then the dynamic nature associated with this, if we were to measure this, is probably closer to five millimeters of dynamic translational component, which unfortunately starts to push the limits of the actual implant itself and its ability to compensate and provide some of that inherent stability in a patient who otherwise probably has some of those attributes that we've discussed in regards to facet orientation and predisposition for that spondylolisthesis or dynamic spondylolisthesis. So Dr. Johnson, we spoke about the dynamic instability of, of three millimeters or less. Um, what are your thoughts about those patients that are stable? They have uh, a slip, it's, it's a mild slip, but they're stable. Great question. And that's where we, once again, we kind of revisit the idea of static versus dynamic translational component associated with the spondylolisthesis. As you can see here, we're looking at the lateral x-rays of this patient, both neutral flexion and extension. Noting at the L5-S1, you have some static spondylolisthesis associated with this, and maybe a little bit of dynamic spondylolisthesis at the L4-5 level as well. Um, but understanding that dynamic versus static thesis or translational component associated with the patient, whether it be in the side bending uh, imaging or whether it be in the flexion extension views, is really pertinent to understand that stability and can a disc replacement be utilized in that patient. If you're seeing less than five millimeters of static translation, that's well within the parameters of utilizing a lumbar disc replacement uh, for that patient. Um, in this case, that is what we're seeing maybe a little bit of dynamic spondylolisthesis at the L4-5 level, but we do have a very static retrolisthesis of that L5 on S1, uh, both between the flexion extension views and well within that five millimeter uh, translation. So do you attempt to correct the translation in a static slip or are you going to put your device as uh, anatomically it's defined uh, by the imaging? No, great, great question, Dr. Suma. Actually, oftentimes, intraoperatively, what we'll notice is once we start to slowly and easily distract that collapsed disc space, that that ligamentous taxity, or if you will, we're recreating the actual position of the discs themselves and realigning any subluxation that we may have with the facet joints as well, you actually get some autocorrection oftentimes in regards to the overall alignment based off of that patient's natural alignment, that patient's natural anatomy. Um, and so oftentimes that autocorrects as you're going through those same steps surgically to mobilize and free up that segment. However, sometimes I have been in the situation where I haven't, it hasn't necessarily corrected, and then we're adjusting our position based off of that patient's anatomy. Once again, with a disc replacement, we're not trying to necessarily correct any crazy curves or correct any um, any deformities. What we're really trying to do is recreate that patient's normal kinematics. And so we are confined to that patient's kinematics and every patient's going to be somewhat different. Excellent. And, and I just want to, uh, again, reiterate the fact that I have a high confidence uh, in this device restabilizing segments and, and correcting to some extent a, a stable, very mild uh, translation because of the, the ball and socket, because of that semi-constrained nature of the device. Um, I think once everything is set uh, and the bone is healed around and, and with the device, I find that it's a, a very stable construct. Another situation related to the facets which I commonly see is a patient who's had a prior microdiscectomy at the symptomatic level. Uh, and so the key considerations in a patient that's had prior microdiscectomy is that the segment must be stable and at least 50% of the facet must be intact. You really have to look at that. Some surgeons are more aggressive about their facetectomy to get into the spinal canal. Others are less. 
The last point is we have to watch for iatrogenic PARS defects. Dr. Johnson, what are your concerns about those patients who've previously been operated on, and does that change your preoperative diagnostic algorithm? So it actually doesn't change my workup. I'm still going to do the exact same things. I'm still going to obtain my plain film radiographs with flexion extension views, side bending, AP lateral, CT scan, DEXA scan, MRI. And I think it's very pertinent, especially when we're getting into somewhat more complicated patient scenarios where they've had potentially posterior microdiscectomies and posterior, if you will, elements removed or structural integrity that has potentially been violated to some degree. I think it's even more imperative that we follow the algorithm because oftentimes there are things that we may not actually see if we didn't otherwise do those steps. And, and I would like to, to second that. Um, whether they're a patient that's coming in with axial degenerative disc disease type symptoms or if they're coming in having been previously operated on, I'm following the exact same steps for my workup. So in these patients, going back to the, the microdiscectomy specific patients, they've had surgery before. There's now scar in the canal, potentially that root is tethered. Are you concerned about the risk of neuropraxia in these patients? Another great question. Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, some of the factors that I actually look at when I'm looking at a patient who has gone through post, uh, previous posterior microdiscectomies, and what oftentimes we're going to note, and most of us have seen, is that at some rate, those patients continue to degenerate. They continue to collapse. And so I'm really looking at each individual patient in regards to how collapsed are they? Are we truly bone-on-bone -bone modic three-type changes where this has a chronic nature to it? Have they had radicular symptoms of a chronic nature as well? Um, and looking at the overall potential risk for that neuropraxia versus a patient, for example, who has the beginnings of disc collapse or the beginnings of that degeneration, but not, not necessarily to the point where they're at modic type twos and modic threes and been bone on bone type etiology for a long chronic time period. I think that's really what boils into it and looking at, okay, is this a newer onset or have they been living this with this for a long, long time? And then also truly, uh, once again, following those steps and working up a patient. Dr. Johnson, how do you evaluate these patients? Um, and we've talked in the past and, and you've talked about high risk, low risk patients. Um, what are you doing to prepare the patients who've had prior surgery for, for uh, arthroplasty? Honestly, my approach to this is, is being more uh, preemptive or uh, trying to preemptively target it or treat it versus waiting to see if it happens or not. And so if I have a patient who comes in that we do the same workup like we've been discussing um, and they're showing or have that chronic, chronic type collapse, that potentially chron uh, chronic radiculopathy associated with it, just basically a higher risk for potential neuropraxia or as we go through an example here, we're noticing more scar tissue on their MRIs. We're noticing more of these chronic, uh, chronic type uh, symptoms and imaging. Then I preemptively will try to treat them a little more aggressively than versus or versus just waiting to see if they actually develop it. And so right off the bat, before we even go into surgery, I'll enroll them in the physical therapy, but a very aggressive stretching regimen where we're, we're not just trying to mobilize and stretch those ligaments and the muscles, but doing our best to try and mobilize the nerve itself and trying to free it up as much as we possibly can. So definitely going into a very aggressive stretching program, then preoperative and intraoperative, giving IV uh, steroids, Decadron choice, uh, your choice, surgeon's choice, but IV intraoperative steroids. And then also as we're actually performing the surgery itself from a technique wise, as we're mobilizing that segment and we're providing not just indirect decompressions, but we're freeing up those nerve roots, oftentimes we're able to go back there in that posterior lateral corner and actually free up that annulus and the foramen itself and actually visualize the nerves at some points, depending on how much uh, we're able to actually see back there. So oftentimes if I'm able to do that, I'm also bathing the nerve in steroid intraoperatively as it's exiting or in the foramen itself. And then from a postoperative perspective, uh, we still continue with a stretching regimen. It's obviously not going to uh, be as aggressive as I would 
preoperative because I am trying to allow that patient to heal, but I am continuing on with a stretching regimen. And then oftentimes I am utilizing an oral taper steroid dose over the course of a few weeks to help avoid that neuropraxia. Now, oftentimes if you didn't do this or if you have a different type of protocol or you may have noticed is that oftentimes patients don't even exhibit any signs of the neuropraxia until a few days to a few weeks after the actual surgery. And so typically I'll continue this, this uh, protocol on and then slowly taper them down and we reevaluate as we're seeing them in the clinic as to are we showing any sort of signs in regards to this neuropraxia? And if so, potentially continuing that, that onwards or a little bit further versus continuing to taper it off completely. I've had surgeons uh, describe uh, their technique of, of managing this uh, and w w a group of surgeons have talked about at the same anesthetic, starting posteriorly, doing a laminotomy and releasing the nerve from the scar prior to the anterior portion of the surgery. Uh, my personal technique is I'll put the spreader in into the posterior lateral corner and then I'll use the curved curette as we teach in the courses uh, to release the uh, uh, PLL from the back wall of the vertebral body, but I'll actually very gently, but very uh, confidently staying on the bone. And I'll wrap that into the foramen, uh, trying to peel off the scar tissue that's developed there, trying to help mobilize that segment. Um, and that seems in, in conjunction with the intraoperative steroids that I'll put back there, um, uh, that seems to have, have been beneficial to me. Absolutely. So let me walk you through as we look at these patients who have had posterior microdiscectomies as to how do we evaluate them. So in this example, you can see that this patient, once again, severe collapse of that L5S1 level with anterior osteophyte formation, the bone on bone, you do have a little bit of retrolysthesis of L5 on S1 and even a little bit of L4 and L5, a little bit of dynamic spondylolisthesis or dynamic translational component with it, but once again, well within the confines of that three millimeter uh, aspect. As we uh, continue to further evaluate, evaluate them, once again, we don't skip steps. So as we look at our CT scans and we're evaluating the facet joints, we're, and this point is very, very important to actually look at those CT scans and to look and evaluate how much bone has been resected, how much tissue has been resected, and what are the chances of it potentially causing more issues. We're also looking for, is there an iatrogenic PARS defect that maybe we couldn't see on the plain film x-rays? As you can see here in the CT scan on the left side, you'll have your sagittal and your axial view. On that axial view, what a lot of viewers may note is you do have quite a bit of capsular uh, calcifications on that left facet joint itself. Now, interestingly enough, this patient had very minimal to no facet mediated or posterior mediated pain upon doing those facet blocks or medial branch blocks for diagnostic measures. And so this patient actually did elect to move forward with a disc replacement. As you can see on the right, MRI, fairly typical in what we would expect to see in this patient. As we moved on with this patient to do the disc replacement, um, continued to follow the patient in that post-op recovery, patient continued to do well. Um, but interestingly enough, we did repeat a CT scan to evaluate that posterior facet. And as you can see from our, our uh, imaging here on that axial view, that you did have quite a bit of uh, that calcified capsule that actually reabsorbed, which is very, very interesting and intriguing on this specific patient for which the patient continued to do well and has been happy with since. The other thing to really look at and understand as we previously discussed is understanding and evaluating, is there pot the potential for an iatrogenic PARS defect that maybe we can't see? Now, in this case, this is an actual patient that I've seen in the past who once again had a posterior microdiscectomy many years before, continued to do well as best they could, but unfortunately continued to have degeneration and collapse of that anterior column to the point where their axial back pain started to become more and more. Once again, same workup, we don't skip steps. We isolated the pain generators, understanding that the majority of the pain was coming from the anterior column. However, in that workup, as you can see here, as we're looking at specifically the flexion extension views, noting that once again, some dynamic spondylolisthesis or dynamic translational component associated with that L4-5 level, but well within the confines of our implants and what we're actually utilizing in the parameters that we look for. 
is we continue to look at this patient and we obtain that CT scan that we always do. You'll note we're evaluating the facet joints, we're evaluating how much bony resection was performed. But as you can see, this patient actually did have a PARS defect that we would have never necessarily picked up on those x-rays without the CT scan. And so our next topic is radiculopathy. Over the years, I've heard conflicting opinions related to treating radiculopathy by way of anterior surgery and lumbar arthroplasty. In this portion of radiculopathy, what we want to find is an anterior source of nerve root compression. So specifically radiculopathy with evidence of degeneration that can be treated anteriorly. So a diseased or deteriorated disc can cause local irritation. So think about the foramen as the disc collapse, uh, foraminal stenosis, as well as intraforaminal tear or an intraforaminal herniation can lead to radicular symptoms. A previously decompressed segment, which has a recurrent herniation, can also lead to radicular symptoms. Dr. Johnson, what are your thoughts about radiculopathy? As we know, and, and many of us are familiar with, utilizing, for example, A-lifts, anterior lumbar interbody fusions for their indirect decompression or indirect nerve root decompression capabilities is very well known and utilized many, many, many times uh, throughout the literature and in practice, obviously. Disc replacements, there is no difference. You are still utilizing that indirect decompression. In the same token, as we've previously discussed, uh, being able to reach back depending on your visualization and actually free up the nerve root itself from an anterior approach based off of the pathology causing the radiculopathy. And so very achievable through an anterior approach, but not always indicated based off of where the pathology for the radiculopathy is coming from. It's also important to understand that in a patient who has radiculopathy without any compressive lesions, those patients don't make for good anterior column Never mind uh, disc arthroplasty patients. We have to be able to find a treatable rationale for their nerve root compression. So, in the absence of deterioration, disc collapse, uh, and the absence of mechanical back pain, these are not proper indications for lumbar disc arthroplasty. And so, to conclude, I have kind of a complicated case on the surface. But using the principles that we've discussed, I think it will become a lot more of a reachable case for surgeons new to arthroplasty. This is a 57-year-old OR nurse that I've worked with for many years. She ended up with a 3-4 herniated disc, fairly significant radiculopathy, and we ended up doing a discectomy. She did well for a short period of time, ended up with a fifth metatarsal fracture uh, that went on to nonunion and struggled. Uh, and in the process of her non-union foot treatment, she re-herniated that L3-4. We couldn't operate on it at the time because of the non-union and the, the healing process that she was going through. Um, and so we managed her non-operatively, but she struggled. Uh, ultimately, once we were given the clearance by her foot surgeon, we planned to move forward with discectomy, repeat discectomy. However, in our workup, we, revealed, we uh, identified a new series of problems at that segment. And we can see on this AP and lateral that now that L3-4 segment has deteriorated fairly significantly. And had we not done our complete workup with the lateral bending films along with the flexion extension, we wouldn't have seen this lateral instability. We can see on flexion extension that she remains stable at L3-4, but that that disc has collapsed. On MRI scan, the recurrent herniated disc that she had looks as though it's resolved. However, given the instability, given the collapse, and given the back pain, radiculopathy, we opted for arthroplasty. So again, we're looking at essentially all of the topics that we discussed. And despite the initial concerns and looking for that unicorn type patient, here's a patient that had been previously operated on had uh, mild instability, had lateral thesis, she did well. And she's back in our operating room uh, working.
Terrific. Thank you, gentlemen. That was an excellent lecture and discussion. Uh, as you were talking, several members of our audience sent in questions. Now, let's see. Okay. Uh, Dr. Johnson, uh, I'm going to start with you. Uh, the question is, how much sacral, sacral slope is acceptable? Absolutely. Thank you, Robin. I appreciate that. It really boils down to a few different things in evaluating and looking at the patients from a radiographic perspective. Number one, can you even get access? Meaning, is their sacral slope so steep that their pubic symphysis is in, in, the, in the way of the actual approach itself? Once you've been able to ascertain that as to whether you can even approach the level, then from there, it really dives into what kind of components of the implants you actually use. In the recent years with pro Discal, they've really done a good job of coming out with more anatomic uh, appropriate end plates to be able to compensate for a lot of those shear forces. Definitely needed to take into account that sacral slope or pelvic incidence in regards to the shear forces associated with it as to what type of implant you're choosing. But ultimately, nowadays with the type of implants and the anatomic variations that they've been able to come up with in regards to the plates, et cetera, it really boils down to can you access it um, based off of an approach, um, and then from there, being able to make sure you choose the right implant for the right patient. Absolutely. And, you know, Sentinel Spine is, has done a great job at creating a lot of options for the surgeon to use, depending on things like that. And now I, I would also point out that of all the lumbar arthroplasty products on the market, there's more clinical studies backing up this, the, the ProDisc. Uh, Dr. Uh, Suma, do you have any uh, comments on the questions regarding sacral slope? Um, yeah, just um, almost uh, uh, in agreement with or in full agreement with Dr. Johnson, but I would also add, I look at uh, sacral slope of about 45 degrees. So I think greater than 45 degrees, we end up with a lot of shear. Um, uh, up to that point, I think we can build a lot of stability with the, the various uh, end plates. You know, that's a great comment. And staying with you, Dr. Suma, uh, have you had an instance in which you uh, misdiagnosed the facets, uh, perhaps leaving the patient with continued facet pain after a lumbar total disc replacement? And if that if that has happened, how did you manage the patient? So I, I would say, um, to, to be clear, I don't know if it would be truly a misdiagnosis. Uh, I've had patients Fair enough. that Thank we you. knew... Yes. <laughs> Um, that we knew that they had facet issues uh, and in the hopes of um, helping with some of that, that facet mediated pain, uh, unloading the segment, uh, putting the arthroplasty in, distracting. Um, but I have had a few patients who we had our, our pre-op discussion and, and were advised that if they didn't get a lot of improvement or adequate improvement, uh, with an arthroplasty, we would end up having to fuse them. And so I have, over the years, had a couple of patients who we just didn't get. We knew that it was an issue, but we didn't get adequate reduction in their overall pain. And so we ended up going through and fusing them. Well, it's a great subject, and I'm glad we're talking about facets. And you did. I know both you and Dr. Johnson earlier uh, discussed it as well. Uh, Dr. Johnson, your thoughts regarding the question of uh, facets? Absolutely. And, and to mirror what Dr. Suma had uh, stated, following the algorithm, crossing your T's, dotting your I's, it really helps set that patient's expectations. So they, they have an idea and they understand the decision that they're making and, and have a very good idea of what they're going to get out of the surgery and what kind of pain they may still have. And to, a little bit to the contrary, I've actually seen a lot of patients where maybe they had, we'll say, 30 percent uh, pain relief with their medial branch blocks or the facet blocks. But then post-surgery, when you realign those facets and you reduce that subluxation, they actually have better pain than you would have anticipated based off of their preoperative evaluation. And so kind of on the flip side, I've actually seen them get a little bit better. But I would agree with Dr. Suma, as long as you're following the algorithm and crossing your T's down in your eyes, these patients have a very good understanding as to what they're getting into and what they're gonna get out of it. And so I wouldn't necessarily say that it would be misdiagnosed. It would be the patient's choice as to what risks are and benefits are they willing to take on. And they understand that going into it. Well, you're absolutely right about that. And actually I should have crossed my T when I when I was uh, reading the uh, the question that came in and, and, and uh, uh, 
Uh, sorry about that, uh, the misdiagnosed word. Anyway, but staying with you, Dr. Johnson, uh, do you have any specific considerations that you employ relating to patient selection for uh, a two-level lumbar total disc replacement? Honestly, it's the same workup that I would utilize for a single versus a double. Now, are there maybe some other factors that come into play that we do want to take into account and kind of more of an advanced evaluation? Absolutely, but for the most part, the workup is still exactly the same. We're still trying to delineate the pain generator. We're trying to delineate, is there stability? Is there instability? Is there translational components associated with it? Is it dynamic? Is it static? Um, we still do the same workup, whether you're doing one, two, or whatever it may be. I tell you, this is a fantastic masterclass. It's a great answer. Uh, Dr. Suma, same question to you. Uh, do you have any specific considerations relating to patient selection. And of course, I would remind everybody the topic we have in our masterclass tonight is specific, is actually looking at patient selection and looking at patients that may be qualified for a lumbar total disc replacement that we may not have otherwise considered. So Dr. Suma, the same question for you. Yeah, I'm, I'm in full agreement with Dr. Johnson. I think uh, following the, the algorithm, following the workup, um, explaining to patients uh, what they're hoping or what we are hoping to achieve. Um, but I think there's some, some uh, differences in one versus two level. For one, it's a, the surgical technique is a little bit more challenging. And um, because I'm, I'm such a believer in um, alignment and positioning and, and precision in terms of where I put the arthroplasty, um, it, adding a second level uh, is, is a little bit more taxing. And so uh, I, I'm a, a believer in really being comfortable with the technique because uh, it, it, it's not one plus one. It's a little bit more than that. And there are some exposure issues in terms of, you know, we need a bigger exposure. And then there's uh, concerns about which level do you do first. It, it would be a great uh, masterclass uh, uh, mm -hmm. opportunity in the future to, to carry a, a two-level discussion. Right. No, you're, you are so right about that. that uh, thank you for the suggestion. So, we have time for one more question, although we have more in the queue. And I'll say to all our audience, if you email your questions on our next slide, we have an email address for you to use. So pay attention to the next slide. But if you'll email your questions to that email address, the guys at Sentinel Spine will, will get answers for you. So our final question for tonight's masterclass, Dr. Johnson, you first, and then Dr. Suma next. Can you share what might be your, and the keyword is absolute, your absolute contraindications for a lumbar total disc replacement. So Dr. Johnson first. Absolutely. Um, that's where you start really looking at one, once again and reiterating kind of what we've covered over this course, over this discussion is reiter reiterating if there's PARS defects, if it's greater than our parameters for both dynamic and static instability or translational component, um, those are probably your biggest ones. And then obviously your DEXA scan. I've mentioned that several times, but we didn't necessarily talk about that. Osteoporosis and actual bone quality and its ability to sustain the implants uh, is also a yes or a no. Now, given the current situation in medicine, we have very good techniques to be able to improve the bone quality. But once again, it is truly a yes or a no uh, when we're looking at that. And so boiling it down, those are more of my true absolutes. Hey, we don't cross that line. Uh, we stick with those parameters um, and kind of go from there. But then there's a lot of relative contraindications or relative indications, if you will, that you can utilize disc replacements in, uh, in these patients and do it very successfully. But for an absolute, that's really where I'm sticking to. Great answer. Uh, Dr. Suma, your thoughts? Um, I'm in full agreement. The, the one thing that I would add is um, I've been asked, could I take a, a pseudarthrosis or a, a level that's already been fused and and take that apart and put an artificial disc in there? And, and for me, that's a that's a hard no. I don't think we're going to gain anything from that. Um, but I do believe uh, every patient gets a DEXA, whether they're a 25 year old man or a 60 year old woman. They're they're all going to get uh, a DEXA for me because uh, the consequence of of low bone density and some subsidence is such a a uh, significant uh, uh, complication. Um, but yeah, I think uh, uh, that pretty much sums it up. Wonderful. That's a, that's a terrific answer. And 
So gentlemen, again, let me thank you on behalf of our audience and everybody, you two were, were fantastic. I apologize, we didn't have time to get to all of your questions. Uh, and I do wanna thank especially Sentinel Spine uh, for sponsoring this really outstanding masterclass. And as I mentioned earlier, email your questions in to the address on the slide, Sentinel will get back to you. And this masterclass, like they all are, will be posted on OTW Broadcasting and our channel on YouTube. Be sure to sign up for all of our master classes. We have a number of great ones coming up. And in particular tonight, I think we had a great suggestion for another one. And thank you all for attending and good night, everyone.